right. Well, the debate on border protection has ramped up as Labor has surprisingly decided to act unilaterally on the issue of the Tamil family, with plenty of off-the-record concern inside the Labor Party that this is a foolish own goal. The government, meantime, is focusing on the economy with the release of the national accounts yesterday and migration numbers today. It's been a busy week of political debate, not to mention the inquiry into two former federal ministers, Julie Bishop and Christopher Pine. So let's bring in my political panel. We'll discuss all of this and a bit more. Joining me tonight, federal Liberal member for the seat of Barker in South Australia, Tony Passon, and federal Labor member for the seat of Hindmarsh in the outskirts of Adelaide, Steve Georgianis. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks very much for your time tonight. Evening, Peter. Uh, hi, Peter. Uh, can I just uh, correct you, the member for Adelaide now? Oh, I beg your pardon, yes, the, the name change there. Thank <laughs> That's you very okay. much for picking me up on that. There you go, showing my age, Steve. <laughs> but you have been the, the member for before and, you know, you've been long there and time, come yes. back, so good on you. Correct. Um, yep. I want to yep. start with the issue of migration. Now, in a state like South Australia, where you have more people leaving than coming, I know positive uh, inflows of migration is a big issue and something that, broadly speaking, I think South Australians uh, would support. Tony, in the government's policy, there's been a real push for people to move uh, to migrant areas. Today it was announced that the government's met its proposed cap of 160,000. But I make the point, uh, particularly on the eastern seaboard, when you're talking about congested cities, it's the net overseas migration number that really matters to people because it's still people on on freeways, public transports, you know, that general congestion that, that, that upsets uh, consumers. How are you going to get people into regional areas under your plan? Well, Peter, I get your point, and it's a, one that's well made. And you also um, have identified correctly that um, a state like South Australia is effectively um, very keen to see uh, population growth. And my electorate in particular is one which has close to full employment in much of it. Uh, and relying heavily on overseas workers wants to see uh, effectively people coming and settling in our regional communities. So uh, our policy is around ensuring that we get the balance right. We don't want to send people, continue to send people to congested cities like Melbourne, Sydney uh, and Brisbane. And so what we've done is a number of things. Um, there'll be 23,000 uh, visas set aside for uh, regional placements, if you like. There'll be scholarships for students to study at regional uh, universities. And there are also programs around uh, things like designated area migration agreements. So I'm very lucky that in my electorate we will have two such areas which will encourage people to come to what I suggest to you is where the jobs are, and that's in regional Australia. And why do I say that? I say that because when I travel to areas like the Riverland and the southeast of South Australia, employers are saying to me, thank goodness for foreign labour, thank goodness for programs like the Pacific Islander program, because otherwise, totally, we wouldn't get the work done on farm, we wouldn't get the fruit picked. We want to ensure that we transition away from those programs over time to people who are long-term residents who can enrol their children in schools, participate in the CFS and buy a schnitzel at the local pub. Steve, how do you get people, though, to stay in the regional areas? I know South Australia wants migrants. I think all of Tony's arguments there were well made, but we know from experience people come to the eastern seaboard, particularly Sydney, and very much increasingly to Melbourne. They stay. They don't go where communities need more people. Look, I think, um, uh, first of all, uh, migration has been a big part of our economy uh, throughout the history of Australia. Uh, and what we need is to analyse the data uh, and look at all the uh, facts that we have and then work on a migration apology with the needs of the nation, the needs of employment, etc. There's no doubt that there are... Um, uh, the regions are crying out for, for work and a lot of the work is being done by migrants in the regions. So I think if we can get people into the regions, it's a good thing. Um, there are ways of doing it, uh, and we do have programs already to try and get people into the regions. For example, uh, you require less uh, of a, the total score that's required in points um, if you are going to a region. And uh, part, of the pro part of the problem, though, is the processing times. Uh, and currently, uh, one of the things uh, that's going very wrong for us in this area is that we have 1.6 million temporary visas people on temporary visas that have working rights in this, in this nation. Um, so if you really want to talk about migration, you've got to put that in the mix as well and see how you're going to deal with it 
and uh, the budget papers uh, that were released basically uh, mention this uh, figure. And they also mentioned that there is no way that uh, we're going to get on top of those 1.6 and process them in time to either return back to where they came from if they're not eligible uh, or, uh, or remain here. But that is part of the mix as well. And uh, Mr Morrison and Mr Dutton are not talking about the 1.6 people, 1.6 million people who are here on temporary visas uh, uh, that uh, have the rights to work. Well, a good case in point there, Steve, is the Tamil family, which Labor appears to be supporting to stay. They're on a temporary bridging visa, uh, particularly while their case is in the court. They're on a temporary bridging visa while there is an injunction and it's in before the federal court tomorrow. They have been working. We know the father in Villa Wheeler. Uh, how does that help your argument? Look, that, that family uh, is part of the community. The community are crying out, asking for that family to stay. We know that the minister can give a discretionary uh, visa. He's done so in 4,000 cases before, approximately three per day, including, so you just including the uh, all pairs. You just made a broad point yeah. about people on yeah. temporary visas with working rights impacting our overall processing times and numbers. At the same time, in the next breath, you're arguing for the exception to the rule with this family. Well, this family, you, you have a community uh, the whole town, the region, saying that they want them to stay, that they are a fabric of their community, that they're contributing to the community, helping uh, the uh, community. Um, so therefore, uh, if uh, Mr Dutton wanted to, he could give a discretionary visa, as he has done in 4,000 cases before, including the au pairs a couple of years ago. Um, so we can't see yeah, the, uh, the why he couldn't do that in this particular case. Court. The au pairs didn't go to the high well, court. The au pairs weren't assessed mm. seven times and found not to be refugees. But I think my, my, my yeah. point more broadly, though, my point more broadly is, yeah. you know, having dealt with immigration cases that come into your office, both yeah. of you as MPs, constituent cases, you get Constantly. to know anyone who's try, trying to ask to stay in Australia and you, your heart goes out to them. There are very few cases that you don't Correct. find compelling. So if you have to make a ministerial intervention on every one of them, you'd have them all stay. Well, if you have them all stay, we have no border protection regime, if that's the case. Uh, but it's not in every case, uh, Peter, that the community or the town that they live in um, is crying out and begging Mr uh, Mr Dutton to keep him here because they are part of the community, that they're contributing to the community, um, that the community actually wants them to stay. Uh, there's very rare cases that are similar to, to this one. Uh, the kids were born here. Um, and as I said, uh, the minister can give a visa, a discretionary visa, as he's done in 4,000 cases beforehand, on an average of three per day, and the au pair, um, the au pairs that were here too. Now, you said that didn't go to the High Court. No, it didn't go to any court because they were handed a visa at the discretion of the minister. After an adjudication by the department. Anyway, we'll agree to disagree. I want to move on to another issue. Tony Passon, <laughs> um, there's been a Senate hearing again in relation, uh, continuation of a hearing, I, sh or I should correct, that has begun earlier, but it's another hearing day today, uh, in relation to the post-ministerial careers now of Julie Bishop and Christopher Pine. Uh, a lot of debate about uh, how they may or may not be using information gained as ministers in the immediate commercial jobs that both of them have taken up uh, at, uh, really pretty much immediately after leaving parliament. There's no standing down for 18 months as is required by the rule. Both of them gave evidence today to the Senate inquiry. I want to play a little bit of what both of them had to say. Do you intend to use your contacts with international and national leaders for Palladium's benefit? I would not presume to call a serving foreign minister of another nation or others on a commercial matter. So, no. Well, I wouldn't envisage a circumstance. Did you tell Dr Parkinson that you would be registered as a lobbyist on the Commonwealth Lobbyist Register? Yes. Right. Well, probably. Probably. Well, can I ask you to reflect on that answer? Um, probably doesn't get us very far. I guess I'm asking whether or not you told him that you would be registered as a lobbyist on the Commonwealth Lobbyist Register. You weren't at the time well, he spoke of, with you. Well, well, no, Senator, it's sort of axiomatic that um, if you are the part owner of a lobbying firm, that you would register on as many 
registers of lobbyists as uh, states or the Commonwealth where you were doing business. All right, Tony Passer. Now, spare me the lines that someone in the Prime Minister's office has given you to say that the system is robust and the rules work. I know the rules better than anybody and you can drive a truck through them. This doesn't pass the pub test, does it? Well, Peter, I'm sure you want me to uh, agree with you, but um, uh, what I'll say is this. Uh, obviously, I've made comments previously. Um, this matter was investigated by Martin Parkinson and I'm not going to... Um, suggest that he hasn't done a um, thorough job and ultimately this matter is currently uh, before the Senate and I think we should respect their processes. I, you probably not surprised to learn, uh, wasn't sitting at home today listening into that evidence. Rather, I was out doing what a good local member should be doing, spending time with his constituency. To be honest, I was at the Adelaide show selling citrus for Citrus Australia, promoting that great product. As I haven't had the benefit of um, the, that evidence, and one thing I've learned as a criminal lawyer is you don't make comments unless you've heard all of uh, the evidence. But I think this is um, something that um, people of Australia are concerned about in terms of uh, their trust and confidence in the executive um, government of Australia, uh, not just this one, anyone. Well, that was very elegantly done, seeing that uh, you're no fan of Christopher <laughs> Pine. But I'll go to you, Steve Georgianis. Um, Really and truly, this is a very interesting development today, particularly in Christopher Pine, where he talked about nominating as a lobbyist, because under pretty good questioning, I have to say, from Jenny McAllister, the Labor uh, senator the other day, uh, I think Martin Parkinson got a bit confused about whether he just assessed them as ministers in these new roles or whether he assessed them against the lobbying code as well as the ministerial code. It looks like very clearly Christopher Pine made it known to Martin Parkinson that he was indeed a lobbyist as well as a minister in an area of his old portfolio. What needs to happen here? Well, uh, they should uh, stick to the standards of both the codes. And uh, you'll be happy to know that I do agree with you on this one. Um, I think it doesn't pass the pub test. And you cannot just undo the knowledge and the contacts that you've gained as a minister, whether it be in defence or foreign affairs, um, uh, when you're working for a particular firm. There's no doubt these particular um, firms or companies or the employers that have taken them on have taken them on because of their experience as ministers. Uh, now, that's not to say that um, you know, they can't go off and work, but surely um, you know, when you're working and you have the knowledge and defence of uh, many, many things that are uh, privy, um, and does this give an unfair advantage to a particular firm uh, that has someone like Christopher Pine uh, amongst it, uh, compared to other firms who are bidding for work. Who knows exactly uh, the future direction of the department? These are the questions that have to be asked, and uh, it just does not pass the pub test. If you speak to anyone out there, these are the things that make politicians look bad, um, mm. that uh, they can go off and use the knowledge that they've gained, uh, and no one, you know, no one begrudges them to, to get work, uh, but certainly when you have that knowledge, when you gain it, and when you gain those contacts, you don't just switch a button and undo it and ungain them. It doesn't work that way. And there's no doubt that the people that have taken them on have taken them on for those contacts and that knowledge. Yeah, look, and I repeat, it's only months since I left the job. They surely haven't forgotten anything. I've been out for nearly four years and there's not a thing I'd say I've forgotten. Mm. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Tony Passon, Steve Georgianis. Steve Georgianis, the member for Adelaide, right this time too. Thanks, Thanks. very much for your time. <laughs>